is six. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you uh, for attending tonight's uh, session again here with us. Um, we have Scott uh, Ar 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 Aronowitz. Aronowitz. There job. we go. I've been, I was practicing. I was practicing. <laughs> Attaboy, um, Jeremy. He, uh, he is an NCAA official. Um, he's also an official with North Florida Officials Association. Uh, he holds the Gulf, uh, Gulf Atlantic Collegiate Football Officials Camp. We're going to allow him some time to speak on that a little bit towards the end. Um, he's done the Arena League. Uh, he does instant replay for the NFL. So, Scott, thank you very much for being with us uh, tonight. Um, at this time, uh, I'll let you get started. Great. Thank Jeremy. I want to sincerely thank you and Frank for affording me this opportunity. And also to my good friend, Dr. Nick Manzi, for uh, soliciting my help here. Not only is Nick a terrific official, he's a great person. Happy to, proud to call him my friend. Uh, the good news is that if you're ever on a, a dating website, and they ask you what your idea of a great Friday night is, you now have an answer. So, um, hey Scott, one thing, one, I forgot one thing. Um, sure. We do plan to be an hour. Um, okay. However, if we have good conversation and good topics and good questions being answered, um, Frank and I don't mind being here a little bit longer. Okay. Um, we're okay. Our attendees who are with us tonight, um, if you want to stay longer for the whole time, feel free to. If you need to go after the hour, we, we don't want to take from your time, your family time. Um, so if, if you have to go, please don't feel bad uh, logging off and signing out. Um, we're doing these, this for you guys and girls out there. Uh, so please just know that um, we do plan to be an hour. However, if we're having good uh, conversation and good topics and questions, um, Frank and I, um, don't mind being on and holding this a little bit longer. So uh, cool. it's all yours, Scott. Excellent. Thank you, guys. All right. Let's, uh, let's get started. All right. Um, here's, some in, here's my information, okay? There's my uh, email address and phone number. Every, anyone, feel free to call or text now, later, during the season. If you have any questions, happy to try to help everybody uh, to the extent that I can – answer. If not, I'll find someone that can or I'll get the answer for you. Um, put that photo. I don't know if anyone can see my photo there. I paid a lot of money for it, so I had to include it. So right now, I'm a, I do replay in the Collegiate Officiating Consortium, which consists of the MAC Big Ten and Missouri Valley Conference. And as, uh, as Jeremy mentioned, co-director of uh, the Gulf of Land Collegiate Football Officials Camp. That we just did our fifth go-round of it. I'll discuss that at the end. Previously on the field, I was a referee in the Sun Conference, which merged with the Mid-South Conference. I've done National Arena League and the Arena Football League. And I'm, the, uh, I'm in the North Florida Officials Association. I was the chairman of the Recommendations Committee, and uh, I do weekly film review. And I want to touch on that real quick. Um, we incorporated our weekly film review in our association of our own games this year. Did about 10, 12 plays. Um, it was a huge benefit to our association. If your association is not already doing it, I, I think it would be wise for you to do so. If anyone needs help facilitating that, um, please let me know. I'm happy to do that. But it helped with um, choosing the playoff crews because every, most everyone got seen and it gave some credibility as to why or why not a person was chosen for a playoff crew. So and I'm proud to say that um, our number one crew got the 8A finals this year so okay essentials of game management game management and credibility are the most important aspects um, of being successful officials our goal as officials is to establish credibility through game management skills during the course of a game season and career all right this is some of the topics we'll be discussing now i have uh i have um tough acts to follow to, the Sunshine officials last week did a great job on communication. If you haven't already, I suggest you go listen to their presentation. It was, it was uh, comprehensive and uh, greatly detailed. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Dead ball period, setting the tone. Preparation, which a lot of what Scooter talked about on Wednesday. Rules, I have rules in red. Um, there are no, there's no excuse for not knowing the rules. Uh, Frank mentioned the other night that, uh, I'm paraphrasing, so forgive me, Frank, that officials know the rules better than the coaches. I guess I'm generalizing. Coaches are getting better. And uh, especially in our association, 
they're engaged with us uh, to, to get better with the rules. So you don't want to be that person who happens to be on the sideline of a coach who knows the rules better than you do. So I suggest knowing the rules, there are no excuses for not. Be in shape to meet the physical demands. This is Florida. We know how hot it gets. We need to be ready. Having a presence, avoiding the appearance of impropriety. Social media. Um, as a rule of thumb, we're, we shouldn't be posting information about our own games. Uh, NFOA has a closed group and we talk, we talk about things there. Um, but I suggest that if you are friends with a Facebook friends with a coach uh, that who you might, whose game you might have, I would either not work those games or end the Facebook relationship. And fans nowadays will look this stuff up, whether it's even if a high school game, all right, they will look for any, any um, issue they can with the officiating. People, people do that. Uh, give equal time, avoiding the appearance of impropriety, give equal time to both sides. We'll talk about that on the field. Sideline control, which I know has been talked about in the past few uh, webinars. Situational awareness and game flow, flexibility and crew unity. Uh, I want to pause for a second and talk about the rules. Uh, this book, the Reading Study Guide, I've been using probably better for the better part of 10 to 12 years. It is the best, uh, in my opinion, uh, means of really getting into the rule book. It's comprehensive. It's got, uh, it breaks down each, each aspect of the game. It has questions, it has discussions. You really get to the heart of why the, this rule, these rules exist. The website, I, I don't make, uh, I don't have any financial stake. It's double S distributors.com. Um, again, I wholeheartedly endorse this. I've been using it either both in high school and college for, for years. Words to live by. Control the things you can control. We can control what we look like. We can control our rules knowledge. Some things you just can't control. We know that by, by years of experience going to ball games. Right? Don't trouble trouble. In other words, don't inject yourself into a situation that you can only make worse. All right. And, and there are situations that arise in a football game that, that we can only make worse. All right. We're there to facilitate fair play between the teams. Don't trouble trouble. No cheap turnovers, no cheap scores, also known as cheap catches turn into cheap fumbles. Okay. That bang, bang play when the ball's on the ground. All right. And the defense picks it up. It's much better to rule that incomplete. You know, this is just an example. There, there are tons of examples. That's one example. So now you have a bang, bang play where it really didn't complete the catch and now the ball's on the ground. When in doubt, we don't want to give any cheap turnovers. When in doubt, if a, if a ball carrier is coming out of the end zone, you know, he reaches over that goal line, let's, you know, let him, let's let the defense earn that safety, for example. See the ball before blowing your whistle. We have, we, inadvertent whistles have been a problem probably since the inception of, of uh, the whistle. So we want to see that ball before we blow the whistle. All right, the dead ball period. The dead ball period starts at the end of our last game until the opening kick of our next game and includes dead ball situations during games. We're currently in a dead ball period, all right? So we want to take care of all the things, control all the things we can control in this dead ball period. Getting in shape, rules knowledge. They mentioned it the other night, what your uniform looks like, all right, inventory. Is my, is my flag faded? Is my hat faded? Do I need new, new stuff? This is the dead ball period. We, if we come up on all, end of August and we're not prepared, um, that's shame on us. Okay, this is the dead ball period. This is our preparation time. More damage is done to a football game during the dead ball period than during the live ball period, including discussions with participants. I think Frank brought it up the other night. You know, the coach has a problem with the play. Um, you know, ball, you know, ball snapped, we, go, we move on and the coach forgot about it. Okay. The live ball period can help us forget about the dead ball period, but the longer the dead ball period is, the more issues we have and more damage done to a football game. Communication, non-adversarial. We've, we've it's been talked about a few times uh, in the past few weeks. Uh, introduce yourself to the, to the participants well before the opening kick. You shouldn't be meeting with a head coach or uh, one of the key assistants right when you're lining up for the opening kickoff. Address participants respectfully. And I say participants, I mean all coaches and players. Those are the participants. 
Coach, gentlemen, please, thank you, sir. Be consistent with that. Talk to them like they're adults. We're not gonna bark at people. And yes, we have to raise our voice sometimes, but um, let's, let's treat everybody like, like they're adults. Be approachable to all participants, respond to questions. Um, this goes to my philosophy with uh, assistant coaches. I think the, in the old school uh, philosophy, um, we're saying, you know, we're not, we're not gonna talk to assistants. We don't wanna hear from assistants. My philosophy, if I'm on a sideline, is if an assistant coach can contribute something that helps the game, why wouldn't I talk to that person, okay? If, if uh, the, the D-line coach uh, comes to me and says, hey, you, you called so-and-so on my, on my tackle, can you explain that to me? Why wouldn't I wanna engage him in that? Why would I wanna say, no, you're an assistant, I'm not gonna talk to you. Now, of course, if, if, if they're using unsporting behavior, we need to address that, but we need, we need to be able to be approachable to all participants. Uh, respond to questions. Coach Harbaugh had a great line in one of his press conferences at uh, Michigan this year, and he said to a reporter, I'll respond to your questions and not your insults, okay? He's holding, he's holding is not a question. Hey, uh, Mr. Official, isn't that holding? No, coach, it's not holding because of this. Why, why is that a foul? Be, respond to questions. Incorporate language from the rule book. All right. Uh, I think there's a, a, a term called lateral um, that a lot of people use to uh, talk about a, a pass that's not forward. Well, the, the word lateral appears in the high school rule book a total of three times, and none of it is in the context of a pass. So, so use language from the rule book, backward pass, forward pass, things like that. All right. And I think uh, those books that I uh, highlighted earlier will, will certainly help with that. Be a good listener, acknowledge coaches. That was discussed um, on both the last two webinars. Um, sometimes they just wanna be heard, okay? There's no reason to talk back if, if, if they just wanna be heard. Use your partners during dead ball conversation. I think John's group uh, talked about informal and formal discussions. Well, if a coach wants to talk to the referee uh, in, a, in a timeout, or he wants to have a conversation with you in a dead ball period, Bring a partner over so there's no misinterpretations. It's not a he said, he said, okay? Use your partners in that, in that regard. Provide timely information. Hey, can you get a number on that, on that foul? Yes, I'll get it the next dead ball, okay? Follow through and get the, get the information to the coach in a timely manner. Communicate during every dead ball period, okay? Especially when you have players engaged, which this is football, you will, when I'm a referee, I always verbalize the play is over. Guys, the play is over, all right? Every single play, we should be talking to, to at least players and certainly our partners. What's the down and distance? What's the line to gain? Things like that. Communication during every dead ball. And to some extent, your sideline, if you're working the sideline, to let them know, hey, let's, gentlemen, let's, let's get back and we'll talk about sideline control later. But we should be communicating in some way on every, in every dead ball period. Use humor sparingly, if ever. Um, this is something that is uh, time tested. Humor is not uh, always interpreted as such. So, you know, if it's one thing if you have a 20 year rapport with a coach and you can, you know, you can joke about something, that's one thing. But, you know, a lot of people don't take it like that, especially in the heat of a game. So. So be cognizant of, of using humor. Okay, eliminating dead ball mistake. Any questions? Cool. Um, I believe Scooter talked about having a checklist, all right? You have your uniform, all the accessories, flags, bags, whistles, et cetera, a rule book, informa contact information for the coaches, the AD, your partners, if you're working with someone that, that you've never worked with before, maybe you don't have that person's number. Bring all that stuff with you. Communication with the participants the week of a game, okay? I like to email both ADs and both coaches no later than Monday. Keeping it simple. No one's going to read it. If they read it at all, let's face it. A lot of these people don't read their emails. But keep it simple. We confirm the date, the time, the site, because some teams don't play on their school campus, special events, homecoming, etc. cetera. Um, crew arrival time. 
uniforms. And I say uniforms because apparently gray is the new black. And depending upon the, I guess there are 50 shades of gray, so to speak. If the home team wants to wear light gray um, and the visiting team arrives with white, you know, that's really not consistent with contrasting uniforms. So if the, if the home team wants to wear special light gray uniforms, give the visiting team an opportunity to wear the contrasting uniform, okay? But let's not arrive Friday night with, you know, near white and white and make and making it confusing, all right? The darker colors, the darker grays, uh, contrast with white just fine. But these are things that, uh, this happened in an NAIA playoff game a few years ago where the home team decided, hey, we're gonna wear these light gray jerseys and the, the, the visiting team didn't know about it. Follow up with the game administrator. It's most likely the home AD via phone. Okay, make sure you have a dialogue with these people. Reconfirm all the information contained in that email. Ensure that both sides are on the same page. So if you're going to, for example, have a 25 minute halftime for homecoming, make sure the visiting team is aware of that too. Okay, because you know how coaches are. They're on a schedule. Everything is on a script. Everything's gotta be in order for the most part and five minutes off can really mess up their, their night. So be ensure that both sides are on the same page. You want to, if you're the referee, email your crew, keep it short and sweet. We don't, we don't need these long emails and I've seen them long drawn out emails, just like, just like participants. Nobody wants to sit there for an hour reading an email. Okay. Scouting reports and team ten tendencies. These are all delegations you want to make to your crews. Um, so I think, uh, pretty sure it was mentioned the other night, we have Max Preps, we have NFHS website. We can get information, all the information we need about teams, the coaches' names, et cetera. I think Scooter mentioned that. So that if you go, if you have a popka on Friday night and you expect them to throw the ball 35 times, shame on you, you didn't do your homework, all right? We can get all these, all this information about the teams beforehand. Rules review, hydration. Make sure your crew, your guys, and gals are drinking or hydrating the week of, okay? Because the last thing you wanna do in a, in a game where it's competitive is have your, one of your people go down and now bring the clock operator down who's never worked a big game before, all right? We gotta stay in the game. Uh, let me add a couple things with that last slide, if, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Number one, if, if any association or uh, referee, white hat is having the difficulty weekly, uh, getting in touch with the homeschool athletic director or anybody at the school, please contact us and let us know. I can reach out uh, and help facilitate that process and make that happen. Um, and number two, if there are uniform issues, um, please, it's, it's imperative that you make me aware of those issues because it's my goal to deal with all those issues during the regular season before we get to the playoffs. So we're not, we're being consistent throughout the state. And most of our teams do try, some of them try and slip the gray, the light grays in uh, as homes. And I, uh, we deal with that all the time. Uh, and I very clear white on the road, dark at home. So just make sure that you're communicating with me. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thanks. Hey, Scott, before you go on, uh, yeah. you know, one, one thing about that first point, and I think is so important, you talked about that dead ball period, which is great during this time of year to refresh your uniforms and all, but having that checklist of your uniform, uh, you know, just uh, Scott and I were on a college game. We went up to Georgia to, for this game, and we find out that one of our, our guys on the crew didn't have pants. So, you know, you remember that, Scott. And so we're frantically trying to find pants. This is a college game and we forgot it. That's how important a checklist is to be able to do. You know, you can keep it on your computer, print it out every week, and just make sure you check off as soon as you got it. So you have your uniform when you go to the game. Yep. And even bring extra, like uh, I believe was mentioned on, on Wednesday night. Good point. Um, okay. Game day. Arrive at the site early and address pro dressed appropriately. Um, you know, that's up to your associations. If, if shorts and a, and a polo shirt are okay, so be it. That's up to your association. We do, we do slacks, collared shirt, usually with our, our uh, logo and uh, no jeans. That's, that's our um, policy here. Determine with the AD whether anything has changed. Maybe they're moving the homecoming parade to before the game. 
Okay. And again, make sure everybody knows because now, now the visiting coach has prepared for a long halftime and on his script, he's got, he's got things to do at halftime and all of a sudden things have changed. Make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, I put this in red, find out the location of both teams locker rooms. And I'll, I'll talk about that after, but it's very important to know where these teams are located. Okay. Um, Pre-game, which is pretty much covered in great detail the other night by, um, by Scooter. This game is the only one that matters. So the JV game you had on Thursday or the, or the, your double dipping, you had a varsity game the day before, unless there's something from that game that's, that can help the crew on Friday, it's irrelevant. Nobody wants, nobody in that building and that, and that's on that campus wants to hear about what happened the day before. Okay. This is the only game that matters. Be aware of your surroundings. You know how these schools are. People are walking around outside, you know, they can hear things. So be, be aware of, of where people are and what you're saying. And, and of course, when you get changed, make sure there's privacy. Leave the locker room fully equipped. The last thing you want to do is go onto the field and say, oh man, I forgot my game card. I forgot my whistle. I forgot my watch, things like that. And now you're running in and, and maybe nobody notices it, but someone might. So, you know, it just goes to being prepared. Um, and showing that you're ready to, to, to get out there. Right. So now we're ready to go onto the field. You know, as soon as we walk onto the field, all eyes are on us. What does our uniform look like? Or do we look confident? Are we slouching? Um, do we look nervous? Everyone, all eyes are on us, okay? And, you know, when I talk about credibility, the thing we, the thing we wanna do, our ultimate goal is to be the person who the, the coaches see either an email or they see walking toward the field and say, you know what, Nick is here tonight. That's one less thing I have to worry about. Okay. We want to be the, that person uh, that once we walk on the field, okay, that's fine. I got more, enough stuff to worry about. I don't, I know that this game is going to go fine. All right. Make good use of the time on the field. All right. Eliminate safety hazards. When we go on the field, it's not the time to, to find our friends in the stands. It's not the time to see what they're serving at the concession stand at halftime. Eliminating safety hazards, identifying key personnel like security, game management, medical. Usually they'll introduce themselves to you, but seek out these people. Quality discussions with the chain crew and ball personnel. Now, some schools have professionals doing this stuff. Some schools, you, you're finding them at the last minute. But at the very least, we need to make it make sure they understand that they're on our team. Okay, so we know the ball the ball personnel will wear their jerseys of the school from which they came, and you know, and, and invariably they're on a uh, an enemy, quote enemy sideline. You have to make sure that these people know that we're on their side and they need to do their job and focus. So you know, the chain crew that's oh, I've been doing this for 50 years, you know. Okay, well, we've never worked before, so let's talk about certain things, all right? Uh, be inclusive, make sure they know that, that we're all on the same page, that they're part of our team, we're gonna work together, okay? What, what your expectations are. Separation of opponents, okay. This is why we wanna know where the locker rooms are, okay? We shouldn't be surprised when the home team, or the, let's say the visiting team is out on the field warming up, here comes the home team out of their locker room, they have to cross through there's no other way to go. I have to cross through the visiting team in order to get to their sideline. We need to know this stuff beforehand, okay? So that we're on alert. And when these, when these teams cross pollinate, we need to be there as a, as a little wall, a wall of zebras to ensure separation. Make sure they go, go through cleanly. There's no hindrances. There's no pregame nonsense. It's vital. We should, there shouldn't be any surprises. This is something, a lot of times the pregame stuff, the, the drawing, you know, the, the, the nonsense that goes on before a game, we can we can step in and stop it before it gets out of hand. Okay, very important. Meet with the coaches, make it short and sweet. Everyone properly equipped, the usual stuff. Ask about plays or formations out of the ordinary. They're going to run tonight. If they're going to run a swinging gate, that's the time when the coach should tell you they're going to run a swinging gate. Things like that. They may run a fake punt. Things like that. They might ask, "Hey, I'm lining up." 77 as a as my quarterback is that legal things like that that's the time to get all that stuff um discussed do you have any coach do you have any questions about your opponent's film oh yeah 
the linebacker, I notice the linebacker, you know, blocks low on the running back every time. Okay, we'll look for it. All right. Things that will help our game. Um, are they staying out? Are they going in? Where are they going to be at the coin toss? All right. Give equal time on both sides if they want it. All right. If you're if you're spending if the the teams are out there and you're um, talking to personnel from Team A, then you need to talk to personnel from Team B. It's subtle, but th these are things that people notice. Again, appearance of impropriety. You don't want to spend too much time with one team. What you do want to do is meet with the key players, and it was discussed the other night. The referee should know the quarterbacks' names. He should introduce himself to both quarterbacks. The umpire should know both centers' names, introduce himself to them. The kick receivers, the back judge should talk to the kick receivers and talk about what is and what is not a uh, proper fair catch signal. And, and the coaches, you know, meet with the, introduce yourself to, to the coaches from both sides. All right. So, Scott, uh, before you sure. move on, we have a question. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read it verbatim for you. When okay. an official is standing on the field, I was once told never cross your arms or keep hands on hips. What do you say? Well, body language is 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 uh, an extremely big part of how we convey uh, what we're feeling. And I, I'm not sure if it was Wednesday, Wednesday night or last week. Someone talked about a stand with my hands behind my back, and uh, you know, almost at an at ease position uh, for those who serve in the military. Um, arms crossed sends a signal that that you know this is this is not where I want to be. Hands on hips sends sends a different signal. Um, Neutral signals, okay? And I and you don't want to look too serious either. You want to look serious, you want to smile a little, and I'll talk about smiling later. But certainly, our body language gives off um, a tremendous amount of different signals. So the more neutral our body language is, the better, um, the less they have to interpret, okay? So, you know, and if you catch, catch someone doing it, um, walk over and say, hey, you look like you're... Uh, Look like you're bored out here. In fact, I had a, there's a, a good friend of mine, Mike Moten, who was my first umpire in college. He's now an SEC umpire. Um, he used to yawn. He used to yawn all the time in the middle. I said, Mike, when you yawn, it looks like you're you're tired and you're bored of being here. At least cover at least you know cover your mouth. So he started doing that, and maybe that's why he's in the SEC now. I don't know. I'll take credit for it. So um, I hope I answered that question. Okay. Okay. Coin toss, setting the tone. All right. Short and sweet. Ensure that the captains and teams are ready. So now we know we've already figured out where they're going to be at, at the toss. Um, so we know where the locker rooms are. If we need to go get them and bring them out, we're not preaching to the captains. All right. They don't care. They really don't care what, what our names are. Quite frankly, they don't care what the back judge's name is. Um, they don't care how much experience you have. You know, they care about playing football. So, but also make sure they're listening to you. If you're going to talk to the captains, this is for referees. And with the poll numbers the other night suggested that many people are interested in, in doing that position. Um, you know, make sure they're, they're listening to you because you have something to say. Keep it simple. Coin toss shouldn't take more than 45 seconds, quite frankly. Make it, unless it's ceremonial and then you know, we have a guest flipper, things like that. I'm not talking about that. The content should take no longer than 45 seconds. But make it about them. I tell them that being captain is a great honor. I congratulate them. But that honor comes with responsibility. You rely on them to take care of the business before we have to do it with flags. All right? Put it on them. They're, they're the most important people on their teams. And don't ever let a team kick off in both halves. All right? If a, a team says they want to kick, we know that they want to defer to the second half. All right? Simple things like that. Um, Sideline control. I like to frame it as our work area. All right. If you talk in terms of the sideline as your work area, um, that kind of clicks, you know, and just saying, Hey, you got to get off my field, things like that. Um, find the team personnel who will help. Usually if the team has a get back coach. All right. And that person, if, if he or she is responsible and competent, will do their job and you won't have to worry about it. But establish lines of communication early and often. If I'm on a sideline, I will, I will look down or, you know, if, I, if I'm not in front of the team box, I'll look around me and say, hey, gentlemen, let's back up, please. Let the snap is imminent. Things like that. Constant communication so they know you're always on, 
you're always aware of, of where they are and where you are. Hey, this is my work area. Don't forget, hey, let's, let's, let's be safe here. Positive reinforcement, okay? And if all else fails, I mean, the head coach has so much to, to worry about. We don't want to involve him in, in, unless necessary. Okay? So if I go, coach, you, coach, your, your running backs coach keeps coming, coming into my area. Can you do something about it? Yeah, no problem. I'll take care of it. And you probably won't see that guy again the rest of the night. All right. Differentiate between legitimate coaching and unsportsmanlike behavior. You have a big hit, you know, uh, in front of in front of a bench. The, t- the coaches get up there. They're pumping their fists. They come a, f- a few f- a, f- a yard or two onto the field because they're excited about it. That's legitimate coaching. That's spontaneous celebration. All right. A coach coming onto the field to tell to talk to an opponent or to tell you something that you don't really want to hear is unsportsmanlike behavior. But let's, let's in a dead ball period, if, a co- if coaches want to get excited, take a few s- steps on the field without, uh, without harm, let's let that happen. Okay. Take advantage of the rules pertaining to the team areas. Now we have, we have our rules about sideline warnings and things like that. We shouldn't have a sideline warning on the first play like I've seen. Okay. Uh, but if necessary, use it, but let's use, use the communication early and often. So we don't have to use flags. Okay. Because a, it's a, it's a game stopper and B it creates uh, an adversary relationship. And the, let, let's not listen the coach official relationship dynamic is the most unique, not only in sports, but probably in society. All right. We all have to work together. We all need to get along. We have to be on the same page. Uh, but it gets, it can be an adversarial relationship, but the things we could do to reduce that, um, tension will go a long way in game management. All right. And I'm not saying don't throw fouls if, if they get in our way, you know, the, the automatics are, if you're running, you know, if we have a, um, an interception return or we're running down the sideline and we bump into a coach, yeah, that's, that's, that's easy. That's 15. Uh, but to the extent that we can get them back consistently and they're not, interfering with our game and our work area, let's talk to them, okay? All right, dead ball officiating. This is in red. And, and what, what, let me just uh, back up a little. These topics um, are, are usually uh, pretty much from things that we saw all year in our, on our game films in, the, in our uh, association, association meetings, okay? Dead ball officiating is one of them, okay? We have to have eyes on all the players when the ball becomes dead. There's no excuse for that. So our range of vision has to get, has to be big because there's on a given night, there are five of us, lower levels, four, okay? We need to have a, a, a great range of vision. All right, communicate after every play. I don't know why that did that. All right, we talked about it. communication after every play. Here's one that we see a lot. Prioritize situations where opponents are convened, especially on the ground and in team areas over the location of the football. So what I'll see on film is a play ending, um, two linemen, two opponents who are linemen on the ground, um, not lying there, but, but still in a, in a bit of a tussle, and the umpire running right past them to go get the football, all right? That's the kind of thing we're talking about. The football can wait, unless we're, unless we're doing a, you know, a hurry up or things like that, in which case, you know, if, if they're not getting back to their auto, that's on them. But let's stop for a second and say, all right, guys, the play is over. Let's get up. All right. If we take a few seconds to do that and they get up and go to their huddles and then we go get the football, especially now with the 40 second play clock, you know, we have time to do that. And it's incumbent upon us to eliminate those situations where we have opponents um, who could turn into uh, trouble areas. All right. So forget the football is my point. All right. Unless we absolutely have to. Let's worry about opponents. Same thing in the team areas, all right? Uh, we have a, a run that ends on the sideline, all right? We're squared up to the middle because we want to make sure the umpire sees us, uh, that we have a spot, and we have a red player in the, in the blue bench or the, the white bench, and, and our back is to them. We, that, that can't happen. Talking about spots. How far into the field of play should we be if we're a line of scrimmage official? Um, the rule of thumb is no player should be behind us. All right, but I, we stuff we've seen on our film where we're where we're coming into the numbers, signaling a dead ball spot, and we have opponents behind us um, that we should be looking at. 
when we have a spot, where should we be looking? And we'll, we'll get to that. Scoring plays. Once the runner crosses the goal line, where should we be looking? You all have uh, probably in your local areas um, on Friday night, the local news will show highlights from games and how many times you see a score, a long scoring play. When I say long, I'm talking about 15, 20 yards at least where the player's in the end zone, the ball's in the end zone, the line scrimmage official stops at the goal line, squares to the middle of the field and puts his hands up for to signal a touchdown. All right. Happens all the time. We're going to try to, we're going to talk about that. The difference between over hustling and moving with a purpose. It's great if our back judges can run like deer. Fantastic. Okay. Um, but at the end of a play, the back judge shouldn't be on the sideline with the line of scrimmage official helping out with, with two players. Okay. We want the back judge to be looking. We, we know he can run. We know we can get to that sideline quickly, but again, we need to prioritize the importance of looking at all the players when the ball becomes dead rather than helping out one official with two players. Now, obviously if, if the situation dictates and we, we sense that there could be something going on on the sideline, by all means, let's get over there and help out. But, you know, we don't, we're, we're talking about our angles. We're talking about our range of vision over, you know, over hustling to a sideline where you know, we want to save our energy. Okay. Okay. Here, this is what we're talking about. Okay. That, that, uh, and this is, this is really high tech stuff. So, so we have player A with the football, player B right behind him. We have a scoring play. <clears throat> and what happens? We stop here, we square in, and we look here. Okay. We don't know what's happening with these two here because our vision. Now, of course, we have a back judge here, but as I said, our back judge needs to have his, his or her eyes over here. All right. So, what should we be doing on a play like this? All right. Everybody in the building knows that this ball is across the goal line. Everybody in the building knows that the player has scored. The cannons are going off. The, the band's playing. Everybody knows it. Okay. There's nothing that says that we can't trail them all the way to the back of the end zone and say, gentlemen, plays over. Plays over. Because what's going to happen? The guy without the ball who just got scored on is going to be upset that he got scored on. The guy with the ball might say something that he shouldn't say. All right. And they might escalate it, okay? And if we're standing on the goal line, not looking at that, not communicating with them, not making our presence felt, that's how things get out of hand, all right? So let's forget on a long run, when everybody knows that the ball is in the end zone, let's forget about stopping. We can put our hands up as we're crossing the goal line, but let's get to those players and separate them and get the try going, all right? Things like that. These things are going to help our game. All right. Especially at night with the, you know, gets the, the lights get dim in the back of the end zone. We don't know what's going on. Let's get back there and talk to these guys. Any questions on that? Hey, Scott, we have a, a raised hand. Uh, okay. from Thomas. I believe he has a question. I'm going to see if I can get him to speak on it. One second. Okay. Okay, it does, it's not looking like I can change him. Hey, Thomas, why don't you go ahead and write your question in the chat box for us? So that way we can answer your question. Okay, maybe we'll come back to him. Okay. All right, so that's the, that's score long scoring play where we, we're not getting to the goal line. Everybody knows it's it's a it's a touchdown. We're just getting to the players to separate them and get and and to uh, prevent any any conflict, preventive officiating. Okay. Um, a regular scrimmage play. Okay. So what do we see on film? We see when the ball is spotted here, ball comes to a ball becomes dead here. The wing official is spotting the ball. So what are we doing? We're looking at the umpire, who's looking back at us. And we're not watching these folks right here. All right. Um, what's, what is the umpire looking for from us? Our face or our foot? He's looking for our foot. So if he has our foot, he doesn't need our eyes. All right. Let's keep our head on a swivel. Okay. Because these two, these two are probably going to be locked up all night. The wide receiver and the D-back. 
All right, and there are no eyes on them because look, our back judge is cleaning up here. This is his range of, range of vision. But we, this is, these are the two that we let go. And all of a sudden someone's on the ground and we don't know why, all right? Keep our head on a swivel Set, and back in, not just to the left, but to the right. Because we could have a, we could have a split, you know, an end here being covered, all right? So let's, let's, let's eliminate having to look in the middle when, when it's not necessary. We've got all these people here covering the players in the middle. The umpire's only looking for your foot. Head on a swivel. Let's look around. Let's talk. All right, play's over, guys. And once the umpire has your spot and, and the, the opposite wing official has a soft spot and you need, to get, you need to get to these folks, go get them. Go get them, all right? Unless it's a critical line, you know, this is more important. This game management is more important than a, than a first down run that gains two yards. All right, keep things in perspective. Same thing with, uh, I think I talked about it earlier with, with the, the sideline play where the back judge doesn't need to come on over here. The line of scrimmage official can cover this right here. All the other officials are cleaning up. This is all clean up. All right, we have to keep a wide range of vision to look for, you know, blindside blocks or silly things after the play and, and be alert to it. All right. If some, especially the referee, if the quarterback ends up on the ground, we need to know how that player is ends up on the ground. Okay. Things like that. And then uh, team areas. All right. I talked about it earlier. Unless it's a unless it's a critical line, um, this is the priority. These two people in a team area, whether it's the white team or the red team. So our focus, our range of vision should be outside. And if we have to come off the sideline and go get them, because now we have a soft spot here. Okay. And everybody is just cleaning up. Everybody's cleaning up. Any questions on that? Hey, Scott, uh, I think we have a question from Thomas earlier for that. Okay. Goal line. Uh, if the, for that goal line play you did the first play. Yeah. Uh, he's saying, can you hold the goal line and turn and face the action? Yeah, without question. Um, but, but what I'm saying, I think it, it depends on it depends on two things. Number one, how long is the run? Okay, um, a run over 20 yards, depending upon how how fast we are. Um, you know, we're obviously not going to get there. And it also depends on where does where do the runners stop? If the runners stop a few yards into the end zone, sure, we could stop on the goal line. I'm not talking about being at the goal line when when the runner crosses. Uh, you know, five, seven yards in it. We're already there um, and we're just turning and looking. And, and in that case, everybody's in a, in a smaller area. He's likely not going, you know, in a running play from the five yard line, he's likely not going to the back of the end zone. Um, and if he is, we're going to follow him. But yeah, our eyes can follow, follow them. But I'm just on a long run where, where the momentum takes him all the way to the back of the end zone. You know, it, there's no point in stopping at the goal line when we could just go and retrieve the football and as we're talking to them. Because do you want to shout from 10 yards? Would you rather shout from 10 yards away or would you rather get up, right, right, get right up on them and say, all right, gentlemen, I need the football. The play's over. Let's go line up for the try. Things like that. So there's nothing that says you can't – I'm not saying you can't, you know, put up a signal and turn and look at them uh, by all means. You know, the back judge in the back of the end zone, if there's a, a pass – a touchdown pass in back of the end zone and, and the back judge is going to turn and watch the receiver so he doesn't spike the ball for it, for example. Okay. But on situation where there's a long run and we already know that the ball's in the end zone, let's go follow those players and, and, and get them separated. And there's one better, more better question Better to do it here, from close Scott. proximity than from 10 yards away. Yeah, go ahead. There's one more question from another sure. person. Uh, it says, so are you saying the official has, that has a scoring play just needs to get to the player and defender and then signal and or signal first. I would signal if I'm if I'm not stopping at the goal line, I would signal as I'm going across the goal line. Now the back judge probably will be on the goal line as well, signaling. So if the back judge is on the goal line signaling already, um, then then we I mean it's I think it's superfluous to to also signal. You know, on a long run like that, the back judge should not be should be waiting for those players on the goal line. Um, but the back judge could, you know, the back judge might be in the middle of the field and these two might be right here, uh, crossing the goal line here. 
So if Bag Judge is here, you know, he's not likely he's not likely to close in yet. That's our job as as the the, the wing official. So if if Bag Judge is already waiting for these this runner and has a has a signal, you know, we don't need to mirror that. We just need to we need to manage the game. All right. The the purpose of this of this discussion is to talk about how best to manage a game and how to avoid uh, how to avoid situations that that could uh, cause issues to our game, uh, detrimental issues. So listen, if we, for instance, if we don't signal on a score like that, um, you know, everybody in the place, you know, sometimes we forget to signal. Everybody in the place knows it's a touchdown anyway. Our clock operator has probably already stopped the clock, um, seeing that the ball has crossed the, the goal line. If not, you know, hopefully somebody's watching the clock and, and making an adjustment, but it's not, I mean, if, if I would rather, I would rather the line of scrimmage official go to the back of the end zone to separate the players. Um, if I had to prioritize over signaling a touchdown in that case. So I think it's fair to say that it's probably more important to make sure we don't have any kind of uh, dead ball fouls happening uh, just because we want to signal a touchdown. Exactly. We have, need to prioritize, as I said. So um, because when we're not a presence, when the players think that they're not being watched, they're more likely to do something like talk, talk smack to their opponent or spike a football, you know, and we can't rely on the fact that, that somebody else is watching it. You know, these are our guys. We need to go there and do it. So, you know, the last thing you want is for someone to, to do something on uh, sportsman like that could show up on film. I'm not talking about jawing, you know, you know, player A talking about player B's, you know, sister. I'm talking about a spike, a backflip, something like that, that everybody sees that, that we can't miss. All right. So we need to prioritize in that, that way. All right. Cool. All right. Um, here's what I'm talking about, uh, about field of play. So when we're line of scrimmage officials, especially in the five person system, we want to keep that wide, wide range of vision. Cause I, like I said earlier, we want to keep our head on a swivel. Different schools of thought as to how far into the field of play line of scrimmage official should come. On a first down run that gains two yards, the, the umpire is looking for your spot, all right? It's, it's second and eight, if, 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 if it's off by half yard, second and seven, whatever it is. Um, the only time we really want to crash in is if it's a critical line. So third down and short, fourth down and short, goal line. Those are the times we want to crash into the field and we'll, we'll forego the range of motion because that's the most important line in the game. So the more we go into the field of play, the narrower our vision is. So now if we have players over here on a regular play, I'm talking about a play where we don't need to run into the field of play, you know, that, that, contravenes our rule of thumb that we don't want any players behind us. All right. Part of the pregame is that it should be that if we have a critical line and one of these two has to crash in, that someone needs to be on cleanup to see, to make sure that when they vacate the area, that somebody's watching. All right. That should be incorporated in the pregame. All right. We know that it's if fourth and short, Third and short, we're at the line of game. We need a spot. This person's coming all the way in to where the to where the, the play ended. Okay, vacating all this. So now, who's got to look at it? Back judge, maybe. All right, uh, maybe the referee. Look, glancing over here, or if, or if the head linesman comes in, the referee glances over here. Back judge glances over here. All things that we should we should prioritize. All right, but on a regular play, first and second down, where we don't we're not looking to to get a, a critical spot we shouldn't, we shouldn't come in that far. It's not necessary. It, it, it's detrimental to our managing the players. Okay. That makes sense. Cool. All right. Situational awareness. We must constantly monitor the clock. All right. I know we have crew members who are working the clock, but whether it's high school, college, or NFL, there are clock issues. All right. Again, much like the rules, there are no excuses for, for, for letting the clock run, you know, 30, 40 seconds when it should have stopped. And that's a crew responsibility. Everybody should, should glance at the clock, um, especially if we only have one scoreboard. Everybody, which, which normally we do, everybody should glance at the clock, all right? 
you gain a lot of credibility when you know that the clock is supposed to stop or coach is asking for a timeout or, or um, there's an incomplete pass in the last minute and then that three, four seconds run off. You gain a lot of credibility knowing for a fact that we should have stopped it at 34 seconds and now it's 29 seconds, right? That's game awareness. That, that's credibility. Oh, this person is on his, her game. He knows what he's doing. He's got situational awareness, right? Got to monitor the clock at all times, every single play. Lines again on third and fourth down. I saw this a lot on our film during the season where it's third down and short, fourth down and short. At the snap, it's the most important line in, in the game right now, that line to gain. So our line of scrimmage officials need to get to the line of the game. Okay, we shouldn't be trailing the runner. That way we, we have the best angle um, to see whether that ball, whether that player got the ball to the line of the game. All right. Situational awareness. We've got to know that stuff. All right. Same with the goal line. If we're, um, I don't know if it's five, if, if we're snapping from the five and in or seven, for, seven and in, I'm not sure what the high school mechanic is. We're getting to that goal line. There's no more important line than that goal line. It doesn't matter if we spot it, you know, a yard off from the two to the three or vice versa. If it's fourth down and goal, there's only one line that matters. It's the goal line. So we need to get to the, these critical lines, knowing the situation in the game. Anticipating timeouts, I'll talk about that. Uh, the correct down. We need to know the correct down. All right. We had a crew that lost, lost a down this year, and it cost the team a touchdown. Got to know the downs. Uh, here's one. The locker room is not the place to question decisions. If you have a block in the back that calls back a long touchdown and you go into halftime and the umpire comes up and says to you, you know, that block was inside, right? Well, that's not the time to, to bring that information to us. All right. We don't leave the field with that kind of information. If, if you're sure about something, go save the crew. Go in there. Hey, that block was clearly from the side. Let's pick up that foul. Again, be a crew saver if necessary. If we're, if we're marked off a penalty incorrectly, if we've got the wrong down, if we've got to adjust time, if a block is, if you know a block is in the side instead of in the back, and we can, we can talk our partner out of it, save the crew. That's the time to do it on the field. Situational awareness. You gain credibility when you come in and make these decisions, when you have the confidence to do that. All right, anticipating timeouts. Here's something that, that we're talking about. So now we're, we're in the red zone. Coach um, can't come any further than this, all right? We know that he is, his team is driving. It's the end of the half or end of the game. He's got timeouts left. Running play, stop short, all right? Now, depending upon who you are, and again, this works for me, like Scooter said, doesn't work for everybody. I'll tell the coaches, if you need to get my attention to call a timeout, Feel free to come out of your box and come down and ask me for a timeout. That's fine with me. Doesn't work for everyone, okay? Um, so if it doesn't, what has to happen? In, in all, you know, all likelihood, the line judge is not going to, he may, you know, if he's got to cover something here, he may not be looking at the coach here. He should be anticipating it, all right? But who else with a wide range of vision could be looking over to that coach as he's yelling, timeout, timeout, timeout? We're we should be anticipating that he's going to want one. So it's incumbent upon everybody to see he wants a timeout. Let's get it as quickly as possible. Okay. Things like that. All right. Any questions there? All right. Moving on. Game flow. Okay. Again, communication and rules knowledge are always key in keeping the game movement. Consistency and quality fouls. All right. If you've got a hold on one side, you got to have a hold on the other side. It's got to be consistent. Football IQ, understanding situations. We just talked about situational awareness. Get in and out of quick enforcement opportunities and minimize huddles. Okay, so, you know, if we have um, a, foul, a live ball foul on the offense and the play results in a turnover to the defense, we don't need to get the, the defensive captain to ask if he wants to enforce the penalty. We know it's going to be declined, okay? Things like that, you know, obvious enforcements. If... Um, we have a, a running play that gains 20 yards in a first down, and we have um, clipping on the offense. We don't need to get the captains together. We know that they're going to accept that penalty. Things to get in and out of quick enforcement opportunities. Now, some things might not be so obvious. Um, for instance, I had a play in a college game a few years ago where uh, the um, 
team A was, was in a punt formation. The snap went over the, the punter's head. He kicked the ball. The ball was on the ground. He kicked it from the 10-yard line through the end zone. Well, it's a foul for illegally kicking the ball, and it's the result of play is a safety. And I'm thinking, okay, coach, you definitely. I'm assuming you want first and goal from the five, and he wanted the safety. So some things are not so obvious. Things like that, that I, those two uh, instances I, I, I mentioned, are obvious. In and out. Okay, we're not even we're not even giving them an option to 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 mess up the enforcement. Consistency with the clock stop. Okay, shrinking the dead ball periods. We have one crew in Jacksonville. Who after after the try, they you know the two two officials line up on the t- the ten yard line near side. Two officials line up on the near side or the far side ten yard line. They wait for the referee to signal, and then they all run up into their positions. That's time. That's a time waster. That makes no sense. Keep the game moving. All right. Get the teams in and out of huddles. Get them off the sideline. All right. All that pomp and circumstance doesn't do anything for for the the flow of our game. All right. Any questions there? Keep the ball off the turf, okay? Institute a fine system, dollar every time you put the ball on the turf when, you, when you're tossing it to a partner. All right, that's kind of more fun thing. But, but when the ball is on the turf, it makes us look like we're, you know, we're, we're the uh, Keystone cops. And with a 40-second clock running, it takes time away from the offense. Okay, get teams out of huddles and off sidelines. Again, have changes of possession, uh, after kicks, <clears throat> um, after tries, things like that. This is not to be confused with cheating teams out of their rightful game time, okay? Uh, I don't know if it happens so much on, on the varsity, but at lower levels, you know, we'll, I've, I've seen the player run out of bounds clearly with the ball, and we're winding the clock because we want to get out of there in time. Let that, let's not get, you know, uh, minimizing our dead ball period and maximizing our flow with cheating teams out of their rightful game time. Quality fouls. Know the game situation. Does this foul have a competitive effect on the game? Does it have a material effect on the play? Okay. If you're the, the line judge and your receiver in front of you gets gets taken down, but the quarterback throws a quick slant to his left, um, are we going to put a foul on that play? Did it affect the play? No, it didn't. He was never looking at that in that direction, things like that. If the, 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 the tight end lineup on the left side, you know, takes down – uh, takes down the, the defensive end and the ball is already out to the opposite side, you know, we'll, we'll go talk to them and say, Hey, you know, let's not, let's not be so free with our hands, but we're not going to put a foul on that. It didn't have a material effect on the play. Is it a necessary interruption? And we'll talk about, you know, um, I have a few, a few slides talking about the things that, that we really need to do. We really need to stop the game for, uh, foul. If two players are jawing at each other, okay, and, and, and you know, somebody makes a hit and you know, says, hey, you know, your sister's going to like that. Yeah, is it technically unsportsmanlike? But yes, but are we going to are we going to stop the game because of that? Or are we going to talk to the player? That's just me. That works for me. It might not work for everyone else. You want to be strict about unsportsmanlike behavior, that's fine. But think about the difference between a player saying something and an actual flex where everybody in the, in the place sees this unsporting act. Okay. Maybe we can talk them out of using that language. Use the coach and say, coach, you know, he's getting out a lot of line, let them handle it. But to put a foul, you know, think about it. Is, is it necessary for us to interrupt the game to put a foul on this guy for saying something that really is borderline? You know, it's not like you said, F you ref. That's, that's totally different. We're talking about the difference between saying something to an opponent quickly and actually doing doing some some sort of act that everybody can see. Can we talk to them? Okay, so the tackle has his helmet a little bit in the neutral zone. All right. Hey, tell your umpire, let's get them back. All right. Um, you know, now we now we know that they're on notice that they're that they're lined up in the neutral zone. Make the fouls big. Don't split hairs. You know, the two the wide receiver and the corner tangle up on every single on every single running play. We see it. They grab each other's um, shoulder pads. All right. Is he holding him? He's got a hold of him. But if the, if the defender is not doing something uh, to, to uh, get free of that. All right. We're not putting a foul on that. It's not big enough. If my grandmother is sitting in the top row and she can see a takedown, then it's probably a foul. 
All right. Don't split hairs. We'll talk, we'll talk about that in a slide. You know, formations. Can we can we get the tackle up? Can we can we inform the wide receiver that he needs to really move up to the to the line on the next play? Things like that. All right. Will it show up on film? Can we make the formation legal? All right. Um, we'll we'll talk about that in the slide. Being consistent with it. All right. If we're going to talk to them on one side, let's not throw a foul for the other side. All right. Be able to articulate to the crew and participants why you did or did not have a foul. Why did you have a foul on that? He took him down right at the point of contact. The ball carrier went right by him. Okay, fine. Um, why didn't you have a foul on that? It wasn't, it wasn't big enough. He was able to get away. Things like that. All right. Again, and now safety and sportsmanship supersede all the above. So, um, you know, blocks below the waist, blindside blocks, true unsportsmanlike acts supersede everything regarding competitive effect and material effect. And know the enforcement. But by now you already know the rules, so you should know the enforcement. You know, a lot of referees are like, well, don't tell me, don't give me a foul unless you know how to enforce it. That's a little extreme, but you should still know how to enforce it. All right. Hey, Scott, before you yes. move on. Okay. All right. So we, we have a couple questions. One you'll probably discuss later. The first one is, what do you discuss with the crew at halftime? And I don't know if you have that, you know, you want to explain it now or later. Uh, and the other one is, what's the best way to verbalize that to the coaches? In other words, a DB and the wide receiver tangle up away from the play. How do you talk to the coaches about that? Well, if the, I'll start with that. If the DB and the wide receiver are tangling up away from the play and I can just talk to them and they'll separate quickly, you know, I don't even need to involve the coaches in that. You know, they're, they're, they're blocking each other. Um, you know, maybe a second or two after the whistle, if I have to turn, um, if I have to turn and tell them every play, the, the play's over and it's just, you know, a second or two after the play and then they disengage, there's no reason to get, to get the coaches involved. Um, you know, if it, if it rises to a level where I think it could escalate and they're not listening to me, then I'll get the coach involved. But otherwise, if they're, you know, if things like that, they're, football's a contact sport. They're going to engage each other when they if they hear the whistle and they disengage um or they don't and they do it upon my presence and my voice i'm fine with that um but i you know, some, nothing it says i can't say coach you know 88 is is really um is really blocking well after the, the play and he you know he might cost you 15 at some point you know uh if you put it like that and what was the first question i'm sorry I'm sorry. What do you discuss with the crew at halftime? Oh, okay. So if, if I'm the referee, the first thing I say is, do you have any legitimate complaints from your sideline? I'll say it to the L and I'll say it to the H. Do you have any legitimate complaints from your sideline? Because you're going to hear complaints all game. All right. Um, if, if we have, you know, if we have a, a play that needed to be discussed, I mean, my halftime is really just to unwind and, um, and refresh and, and get back in, into the second half. Um, if we have a close game, you know, but we might discuss the extra period um, and uh, carryover fouls and things like this to remind ourselves of what, what could possibly occur. You know, two minute, uh, the implications of, of the uh, fouls under two minutes, things like that. Um, but if there are no legitimate issues from the sidelines, um, then, then that's, to me, that's, that's paramount because if the, if the sidelines are in check and in the middle, we're, we're, we're I mean, you know, you could, you can sense when things could get out of hand. Now, if we feel things are escalating and we need to tighten up a little, cause we're not calling enough after play, then, then things, you know, how do we adjust? Um, how do we adjust to this game? If they're not going to fall in line with the way we want to, um, where we want this game to go, you know, it's more about adjustment. It's more about unwinding. It's more preparation for the second half. Scott, if I can just add to that, you know, we, you and I worked with each other uh, plenty of times and, you know, we'll go over our penalty uh, report uh, in the college. We have to do that. And, but then after that, unless there's something big, we're just, we are unwinding. And that's so important because everybody's putting stress upon us and it's time to relax for, you know, the, the 15, 20 minutes, whatever it's going to be. And uh, to be able to get out there refreshed and get and do, you know, another half. Exactly. That's a great point. Exactly. And like, you don't want to overdo it. We've done, we've done the preparation. We've done an exhaustive first half. 
We don't want to beat any dead horses. Okay. Do we have any legitimate issues going on? No. Is 88 going to be a problem for us? Yeah. Let's make sure we keep talking to him or let his coach know that he's going to cost him 15, things like that. But we don't want to get into any, anything, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an unwinding. All right. Hope I answered that. Um, okay. We'll move on. All right. Should we throw on this? All right. We've got two wide receivers split out here. Now, notwithstanding the fact that they may or may not be on the line of scrimmage. All right. Let's just talk about where they're aligned. They're almost from this angle on the same yard line. Okay. Um, so the question arises, can we make this legal? And the answer is, if we throw on this, um, is it necessary if we throw on this? Okay. This D back, all he knows is this guy is wearing a legal number and ready to go out for a pass. And if there's someone here, a safety, they know that both these guys are ready. All right. So what, what good would it do if we throw a formation foul, if this guy goes out for a pass telling us he's covered up? It's a game stopper. It's an unnecessary game stopper. We're splitting hairs. Make this legal. Find, well, as we say, find a blade of grass in between them. Okay. Now, if they're, if, if, if they're back here, both of them back here, then obviously they're way off the line. But if it's close, okay, it, let's not have any unnecessary game stoppers, all right? Um, being, being foul happy is not necessarily a reflection of, of a quality game. So if, when we can cut down on unnecessary fouls like this, all right, it makes a better, better game. It just does. Unnecessary to throw in that, okay? All right, how about this? We've got this D tackle. His helmet is partially in the neutral zone. All right. If I, am I is it necessary to stop the game to, to flag this guy for five yards when we can, we can talk to him? We can, I, can, I can radio into the umpire. I can radio into the referee or in college to the center judge and say, hey, 99 is, is, is in the neutral zone. Let's get him back. And then I tell, and then whoever sideline he's on, we say, coach, 99 lined up in the neutral zone. We got to move him back. So now everybody's on notice. So he can't say, well, why didn't you warn him? All right. But to throw on this and stop the game and assess five yards, especially, you know, it's first and 10 here. That's, that's fine. What if it's first and what if it's third and four or fourth and four and his helmet is partially in the, in the neutral zone. He's not gaining a huge advantage. All right. Yeah, obviously, if he's, if he's got a whole head in here, that's different. But, we, but leading up to the snap, we also want to try to move him back. All right? We'll, we'll do our best. But is it necessary to stop the game and assess a penalty and take time because of something like this? To me, it's, it's a no. Okay. This is a little more clear. All right? One, two, three, four, five in the backfield. This guy is nowhere close to the line. This is something that's pretty absurd and egregious that we have to throw on, okay? Um, there's, nothing, there's nothing we can do to make this formation legal, all right? But contrast that with, for instance, making, making this guy uh, in the backfield or this guy in the backfield, okay? Huge difference. There's nothing we can do to make this guy on the line of scrimmage, all right? So quality fouls, games, unnecessary game stoppers, all right? All right, crew unity. We don't want to sell out our crew members, all right? On, on Wednesday, we they talked about conflict resolution within the crew. Um, it happens, you know, there are people that don't get along, but we have to put everything aside. We just do, all right? And we don't want to sell our people up the river. Inclusion over alienation, all right? We want everybody to be involved in the pregame process, um, in, uh, discussions, huddles if necessary, because um, if, if I have information that I think is necessary for an enforcement, I need to be included in that, all right? And especially with, when there's, uh, go through this, veterans must keep neophytes in the game before, during, and after, all right? We need to encourage them. We need no browbeating. We've seen it. We've seen, you know, the, the, new, the new person will come in with information and they'll get talked to the hand. All right, that has to change. We have too much of that. We're, we're trying to train our new people to be contributors to the game. So we need to hear everyone. You can have a disagreement in the auto. Hey, isn't it third down rather than second? 
no, it's not. It's uh, you know, are you sure? Okay, so at least have the discussion. But to but to alienate people and and browbeat them because um, because they don't have the experience that we do is unnecessary, and it it turns people off to officiating. Um, positive reinforcement, especially on the radios, and. I did a lot of chatter as a referee on the radio and those who have worked with me will know a lot of it was unnecessary, but it kept uh, things light. But if, if someone has a, 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 something that, that needs recognition, Hey, that's a, that's a great, great foul there. Hey, great job. Not throwing on that. I saw the same thing, things like that. Keep reinforcing it. That's part of the communication and it, and it keeps people in a positive mood. Don't be a dictator. All right. We're a team. You know, you might be, you might be the referee, you might be the senior person on the crew, but nobody wants to hear you bark out orders to the crew all night. It just it's, it doesn't help. Know your audience, okay? I was fortunate enough in my last year on the field, I had a crew I'd worked with for a few years, and you know, if someone came to me with a foul, I guess, man, that was the worst call I've ever seen in my life. Um, I knew my audience. I knew they'd take it as a joke rather than the person working his first game, if I said that to, to that person, they're like, oh man, then their shoulders would shrug and, and, and you'd lose that person. So know your audience when you're using, when you're using these communication tactics, all right? Use levity. I say, if we're not laughing, we're not living. We laughed a bunch, okay? Um, you don't wanna be, you know, a loose crew is, is probably more likely to be in the game than a real tight crew, in my opinion, all right? Any questions up until this point before I go on to? Um, yeah, Scott, we, ha we have a question. Yeah, going go ahead. Back to your slide when you said, uh, you know, it, look for the blade of glass, uh, of grass. Blade of grass, uh, yep. Uh, why, it, is that, I think somebody's confused about that. Would you mind okay. explaining what you mean about the blade of grass? Okay, okay. So, so these two look like they're lined up on the same yard line, right? So that if this player, if they both go out for, if this player goes out for a pass, um, if, we, if we assume they're both on the same yard line, we'll consider this person covered up, right? So that if he goes out down for a pass and there's a forward pass beyond the neutral zone, he's Ill, ineligible downfield, all right? Unless they've come out and told you, we are both on the same yard line. And some, some schools do that. Some formations are, hey, we're putting both wideouts on the line of scrimmage for reason. I don't know why they do that. I don't pretend to know why, but in this case, it's obviously that, that they're not doing that. So we find that we, we try, we say find a blade of grass. All we need is one blade of grass to separate these two. Not, not, a, not a yard line, one little blade of grass, one space between these two, these two feet. That's what I'm talking about. Make them legal, find a blade of grass between them that make, puts him on the line, puts him in the backfield or vice versa. So that he, so that this is this is a legal formation. So, in other words, you're putting one person on the line and one person in the backfield, right. just to right. clarify the question. That Precisely, was asked. because because I don't because um, again, unless as I said, some formations will come out and we're both on the line. Which again, I'm not going to pretend to know why that makes sense. But just to, to to you know to to put a foul on this for for uh, you know ineligible downfield or legal formation when this is not this this is not deceiving anyone over here these are two wideouts with legal numbers they know that they're eligible to go out and catch passes you know the, they can't see where this guy is in relation to this so so the the defense is at no disadvantage okay you know maybe we tell the coach coach listen they're both pretty close can we can we can you let me know who's on and who's off things like that but we're not going to stop a game um, because of this formation. All right, we're going to let this go and say, okay, this guy is clearly one blade of grass behind this guy, or vice versa. Okay, and that's what I mean. Find a blade of grass in between these two. Make this formation legal, because um, stopping the game for this formation is unnecessary. It's a time consumer. It's it's a time waster. That that clear? Clear as mud. I think they got a, there's one other question. If you okay. talk to the players and maybe even invoke the coach's help in getting them distinctly off and on, uh, do you flag them at that point? Uh, I'd say after I've spoken to the players and the, the offensive coach or the head coach, and they're consistently doing that, then yeah, I'll put a flag on it. 
because now they're on notice and um you know now they're just they they're not listening to you or they're just doing what they want to do which which we don't want because you know so but but they're gonna they're gonna adjust they're gonna adjust all right and maybe maybe this guy thought he was supposed to be online and maybe this guy thought he was supposed to be back okay but in the grand scheme of things in our ball game okay it's 21 7 maybe it's 14 14 a stoppage here is not going to have is going to have a more adverse effect on our game than it will on the defense you see that it's just it's just a mindset that that it, to me it's an unnecessary stoppage thank you i think we got those questions answered okay if if not we'll i'll try to further clarify any other questions uh, before i get to taking the next step and creating opportunities okay so your ability to manage a game will go a long way in your advancement. And the reason I the reason I put up my what I done earlier is not to is not to um, to to boost myself up, but um, whether whether I'm working a high school game, a college game, or an arena game, um, my game management skills don't change. All the things we talked about: dead ball, officiating, preparation, um, you know, making formations legal if we can. Those things, you know, unnecessary quality fouls, those things are consistent at every level, whether it's JV, varsity, middle school, college, pro, it's, those are consistent. And, and that's why I put it there to show, listen, it doesn't matter what level you're working. These, these game management skills and techniques will follow you through your career. And if you use them correctly, you'll get you'll get playoff games, you'll get on playoff crews. And we put together, I will, I will say this, we put together our, our number one crew at, in um, NFL way because we, I, because we knew these people had quality game management skills. Okay. So it goes a long way. Um, mentorship. I think it was meant, it was mentioned either Wednesday or last week. Um, you need to be met, get, find a mentor who is where you want to be. So if you're, if you're new and you want to be on a varsity crew, find a mentor who's on a varsity crew. So, you know, follow follow that that crew around, see what they do in pregame, you know, chart their fouls for them. Okay, um, learn, be a be a sponge, absorb. You get exposure with snaps and scrimmages, um, which, which we'll talk about. You know, the more snaps you have, um, the better for your development. You see, you, you're able to see more formations and things like that. Camps. Uh, Frank mentioned it last week, and um, you know, talk about the one we have. There are camps. I've spent upwards of a thousand dollars on on camps myself. There, Gerald Austin, who's the supervisor of Conference USA, had one in Miami, and he. The last time I went there was like a thousand fifty dollars. All right, um, and you know, there there's there are supervisors there. There are a lot of people, but it's it's a big camp. Um, my camp. Uh, with my partner, Andrew McGrath, who's, who's out of Tampa, we started our camp in uh, 2016 because we wanted to have people improve, okay? Not, not pay money for, for maybe a few snaps and maybe a little bit of exposure. Um, the word collegiate is a bit of a misnomer because we've had, you know, it's not necessarily a college camp. Um, we offer, uh, deep wing, you know, we have college snaps, but we have deep wings as well. So think about in your high school associations, how many snaps do your deep wings get before the playoffs? And there's an opportunity to learn from, from top people, um, where you should be, uh, as a side judge and field judge, for instance, or how to work seven. And we were on eight officials, but it's pretty much the same thing for the, for the deep wings. If you Google GAC Foc, you'll, you'll uh, come up with it. It's geared toward officials who want to improve and take the next step, wherever that step is. So if you're a varsity official and you want to get on a playoff crew, that's your next step. If you're, if you've done a state championship and you, you want to see what's out there for you, that's your next step. Okay. Um, it's small. We have, we have maybe, maybe 60 attendees. Um, you know, some camps have hundreds of, of attendees. 
on many different fields. You know, we, we, we offer the best clinicians in the nation giving back. NFL, FBS, we have some FCS people. Um, I don't get involved in any of the teaching. Andrew and I just, we delegate. You know, we have guys, um, mostly Floridians, who have come through this, the system and taken those next steps. Um, I don't pay my clinicians anything. They come on their own dime. They come and spend their own time because they want to give back. And that's the basis of what we're doing here. Um, talking about the word collegiate too, Frank asked me a question last year when I first brought the camp to his attention, is if you're teaching college mechanics, how does that translate into working playoff high school ball? Well, first of all, I don't think it's, it's, too, it's too different. And, and if you know your stuff, you can, you can um, it'll translate, you can, you can make that transition. But you're also learning all this game management uh, stuff that we talked about today. You're learning mechanics from uh, the best clinicians. You're getting scrimmage snaps, college scrimmage snaps, one-on-one -on -one instruction in every position. Uh, we do breakouts by position. Uh, the clinicians bring their own conference film and we break down the scrimmage uh, that, we, that we've had. So we've been doing this for five years at Southeastern University in Lakeland. Um, may or may not stay there, but we don't plan on, on taking it outside of Florida. Um, you get an ASO discount, you get your meals, most of your meals paid for, and we have college supervisors. If you're, if that's what you want, you want exposure, we talked about exposure, this, this is one of the places to go. It's right here in, uh, in Florida. Since 2017, over 80% of the Sun Division staff and playoff officials in the NAIA conference, and I'll talk about that, um, have attended our camp. Um, and countless playoff officials in, in the state of Florida and FHSA. Um, now, Florida is in a position where there's so much more opportunity today than there was um, even back in 2011 when I started doing college football. So the college group was started by a man named Perry Havner in 1998 when Jacksonville University began his program. So up until that point, you had UF, you had Florida State, Miami, the usuals, you know, FIU, FAU. I don't, I don't even know if those schools were playing. And you had um, the, MIA, the MIAC schools at FAMU and, and, and Bethune-Cookman. But that was it. You didn't have any small ball. So JU began its program there, and Perry started the group. The group expanded when NAIA schools began playing, eventually formed the Sun Conference for football. And the Florida teams merged with this into the Mid-South Conference, forming a 20-something team mega conference from, from Naples up to Cincinnati. Uh, that's in 2017. In 2020, there will be seven Mid-South schools in Florida alone. So the opportunity um, to work at the next level and, and Listen, this is a this is an FHSA discussion. We're talking the purpose of this is high school, but since it came up and you want to know how to, if there's opportunity, there's plenty of opportunity. No one we're not going from working the high school uh, the 8A championship game to the SEC next year, okay? It just doesn't work that way. But now we've got we've afforded this opportunity where we have you know all these schools in Florida and even in the southeast region where um, where there's opportunity to grow. And um, Perry was recently named the supervisor officials for the Southern Conference in April. So um, the, the, our clinicians, the most Floridians, um, and one thing I'll say about Perry, there's six full-time staff members in the NFL started in our group, including one in replay. So I say that because the philosophies that we teach in our camp all started in 98 when Perry started this group. So Jimmy Russell, who's in Tampa, Trey Blake, you might've heard it from Orlando. These two guys made the NFL the last two years. Their, their game management skills, their preparation is the same as, as the guys who learn under Perry who are working NAI ball, okay? The point is it's consistent. We're all consistent. We all have the same mindset. Sure, some people get more opportunity than others. Would, would I like to be working in the ACC right now, of course, but the opportunity arose um, where Bill Carolla from the Big Ten came to our camp last year and offered Andrew uh, and me positions in replay. So, um, you know, opportunity is all over the place. Um, but the point is the, all these skills that we've talked about, all these game management skills, all these guys have it. And all the guys that, that, are, that are making it um, in, in big time football and gals. 
that's what they have. They have the game management skills. Um, they have credibility. So, um, and finally, smile and enjoy yourself. And one knock on me years ago was that I looked like I was, I was mad every time I walked on the field. You're officiating football, okay? Not many people, despite the, the many high schools in Florida and around the country, not many people have the opportunity to be involved in a football game. Enjoy it, okay? Enjoy it. Any questions? Any 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 thoughts? Well, Scott, uh, there was a question that just came up, and I okay. don't know, Frank, Frank or Jeremy, this might be one for you. Actually, are there any camps for rookies? I'm assuming high school rookies that are uh, that are out there besides just what a local association might offer. Currently, from a statewide perspective, no. Um, we obviously, you all know this. We rely on our local associations to have their trainings. Oftentimes. Um, some of our larger associations will bring in folks from outside of their association to uh, join their trainings. But, you know, I, I would encourage everyone, and I think Scott would probably uh, echo the sentiment, even if you're a rookie and you can get into this camp, it would help you, or clinic, it would help you learn. Um, and that's what I was going to ask you, Scott. You, you mentioned there was 60 uh, participants last year and previous years. Is there... It, could that number grow? I think is my first question. Yeah, absolutely. We we can grow, but but what I don't want to do is is get the camp too big, like like some of the conglomerates uh, in other places, um, because we you lose that that personal touch. I mean, you leave the camp with the contact information from your position coach that you call during the year and say, hey, I had a play arise, or here's here's the film. You take a look at this, and they will take all these people will take the time to to help you um frank if, I, I don't know if you remember a few years some years ago it was requ a requirement that fascia had a clinic um that you that you had to do every five years to be eligible for playoffs and as frank said the local associations have taken hold of the training but i mean you know we can even talk about doing a doing a rookie camp um with with our staff you know, in, in something not as advanced where people will get the same uh, instruction. We can, you know, I'm ha we're happy to do that. We're, we have a lot of flexibility. We have a lot of great clinicians that are willing to give back. So if that's something you want to talk about uh, down the road, by all means, uh, let's do that. Yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of new initiatives coming for our officials. And one of those uh, areas obviously is training. This was step one for us to kick off these more, uh, even before the pandemic started, we had planned to have these video uh, type conferences or, or clinics. So all of our officials throughout the state could view them and participate in them. But, you know, my supervisors, Jeremy, along with Jeremy's supervisor, Justin Harrison has uh, reiterated us that, that, that they're financially gonna support us with regards to more trainings, sending people to trainings, setting up trainings. Uh, we want to get better and we want to make sure that we're serving all of our officials in the entire state as best we possibly can. And that's one way. So yes, we, we will definitely talk about that. Yeah. Do. Let me know. Cause a lot of the, a lot of our clinicians are the ones like when you said, you know, associations bring in outside people, they're probably, probably a lot of the same people we're talking about that are our clinicians. And if you go on the, Go on the website, you'll see our whole list of clinicians and probably a lot of familiar faces from local associations as well. Well, the, the other piece of this is you and I and, and um, have had great conversation with regard to your camp and how it would benefit our FHSA officials. And, you know, quite honestly, a few years ago, I'm not really sure that I, you know, a couple of years ago, I felt it would help our FHSA officials. Yep. And yep. what would, how, how would we, and I, I hate to use the word benefit, but I, um, how would it create better officials for us uh, working college mechanic? I totally flip my script on that. And, you know, it's uh, anytime you're doing something and you really talk, we talk through this, anytime you're doing something to get better, you're going to get better, whether yeah. it be at college mechanics, high school mechanics. And the more that I've learned about officiating coming from the coaching arena is that, a lot of it does cross over, some of it doesn't, but so much of being a great official is about uh, penalty enforcement, about communicating, about body language, about all those things 
that you can learn being around your your you know your peers and i think this opportunity this camp is awesome uh i wish i was going to go this year uh i fully support what you guys are doing I've been apprehensive in the past, but now I'm not. And um, that's due to the relationship that we have. And uh, I appreciate you guys and, and what you do. So I no, appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm happy to help. Just, you know, let me know what you need. We can, you know, again, we, we get college snaps at a, at a university. And with Perry becoming the, the supervisor of the Southern Conference, we may or may not stay at, at an NAI school. We may go to Stetson, which is one of his schools. But I it, I don't want to create a situation where, we're sending officials from FHSA who aren't ready for the speed of the game yet. So if we can create a situation where we have scrimmage snaps that are at the level, a lo lower level than what people, you know, than college and still get quality snaps from quality teams um, that aren't, it's not as fast a game at the college level, you know, people will, will be able to benefit from that and not be overwhelmed by it. We don't want to overwhelm people is what we don't want to do. And quite honestly, we, we get excited about our officials moving up. Uh, I think that creates a good recruiting tool for our state. Uh, we have the opportunity. This, a lot of this is happening in basketball right now. Oh, yeah. We have several officials that are quickly moving up the ranks uh, into the WNBA, into the, well, I think it's the G League, uh, that are, are doing great things. And it's become such a great recruiting tool for us just to say, right. listen, all you young people, like there is an opportunity, there is a pathway out there in the state of Florida, much like our student athletes, we, we like to look at our officials as the best in the United States and our football players are the best also. So oh, yeah. there is a path and, and we, we need to embrace that. Without a doubt, Florida is a special place. And, and when, you, when, you, when you have quality officials that move up, it creates opportunity for people to step in there and fill the gap. And that's, but those people that move up, like our clinicians always come back and help bring people up. And that's the whole, that's really the basis of our camp. You know, Scott, one of the things I want to add to not just your camp, your camp's great, but uh, any camp, uh, you know, these guys are coming back to help people out. They're concerned about your, your football officiating well-being as well. Uh, you know, you put in one of your slides earlier about, uh, you know, talking to people in a different way than we may have in the past, you know, trying to lift them up as opposed to tearing them down. And especially with the uh, officials being in every sport, just being hard to come by right now. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's even more important. When you go to these camps as a rookie, it gives you an opportunity snap by snap to have somebody stand there and help you every play to be able to help you understand what they're seeing compared to what you're seeing or, you know, what you should be doing compared to what you are doing. I think those are all important things. And as a rookie, I couldn't think of a better place than to go to a camp to get that. Um, there was a question in the, um, in, the, in the chat, aside for rules and mechanics, what would you say is the most important skill for new officials to master? So, Scott, I mean, I have a thought, but what would you say? Aside from what I'm saying, rules and Aside of rules and mechanics, what would you say is the most important skill for a new official to to master? Um, I think that uh, I think communication, uh, communication with with players, coaches, and and um, and partners, because you know we've all been brand new officials before, and we just want you know sometimes we get overwhelmed. We just want to curl up and be in our own world. Uh, and nobody knows what's going on. But if you if you have a dialogue with people, and I'm not just talking about on the field, but off the field, all right? Finding a mentor, going to rule studies, um, watching film with people, you know? It's important to, to get repetition. Repetitions and watching people and learning from people. So mentorship and communication to me is the most important thing because those are the people that have been there, that have done that. We've all been rookies before, okay? I remember my first game, um, I forgot my, my, something to write with, right on. I had something to write with, I didn't have something to write on, you know? Those are, those are, people are gonna make rookie mistakes and if you get with the right people, they'll help you develop the skills necessary to, um, to get into, you know, more relevant games. Um, you know, mechanics, mechanics are important, but I had a basketball mentor in New York, his name was Eddie Corbett and basketball people might know him. Um, he was a perennial Final Four guy, 
he had the worst mechanics in the world. But when Eddie went to a game in the Big East at the Garden, you know, the coach, like I said earlier, the coaches said, well, Eddie's here tonight. I don't have to worry about a thing. You know, he might have called a foul to the side like this, but the guy controlled the game. So mechanics are important. Being in position is very important. But getting a reputation and managing a football game or any game is vital. You can manage a football game with, you know, I hate to say you can manage a football game with inferior mechanics. You want good mechanics. You want to stay in bed, good habits. But being able to communicate to, to participants and, 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 um, and crewmates, um, and get, developing rapport and gaining credibility and having the confidence to, to um, better the game, that individual game, is, is paramount, in my opinion. So mentorship and communication are most important. You know, Scott, I agree with you. And I think one more, if I may add one, is slowing down. Uh, you know, it, we, it's so important. Every new person, myself included, wanted to be able to get that spot right away. Sometimes you put yourself in danger and sometimes you don't see what's going on because you're right. hustling too hard. Just slow down. Let the game play. You'll eventually – the speed will slow down eventually. Uh, but just try to take a deep breath between each play. Here's another question. Uh, okay. Is a suggestion for getting on the field from an ECO. Uh, well, um, I think that depends on the individual association. And we have, we have, you know, every commissioner is different. And some commissioners encourage, um, encourage new people to get on the field. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, ECO should get as many snaps as possible at the lower levels if, if, if they're, primary position is ECO. But I also think that it's important for associations to incorporate new blood into games. So for instance, if you have, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas playing, you know, the school that hasn't won a game in 20 years, what's the harm in putting in a few new people with the, with experienced people just to get them a feel of varsity games, you know, what they can handle. It's not going to affect the outcome of the football game. Get them some snaps there get them used to and I'm talking I'm not talking about brand new I'm talking about people that have been in the association for a few years have been doing a lot of lower level games have been in ECO for a few years now they want to get on the field let's put them in that situation where you know they do it in college all the time they'll pull you know if, if in Florida's playing in, you know an FCS school like FAMU let's say and you know it's going to be a blowout um, put a new person in there and see how they can handle it they're not going to affect the outcome of the game and, and, and go from there. So I think that um, commissioners need to be a little more flexible with that. Um, and, and the crews who are working these, these schools need to take a step back and say, well, my status as the number one umpire is not going to be affected if I step off this game and go do um, a, a different game tonight and let my crew work and let this new umpire come in. So there has to be a little flexibility there. Awesome. Well, thank you, Scott, for being with us tonight. I don't see okay. any more questions. Nick, thank you for screening questions as well through tonight. It went, went very smoothly. Um, uh, if you guys and gals have any other questions uh, for Nick or Scott or us, feel free to email me. I'll get you uh, the, I'll get the question over to Scott. Um, or if he had his information from the start of the, the PowerPoint, I don't think he minds you contacting him directly. Not at all. Um, so, uh, thank you. Everybody stay safe out there. We do have two more uh, uh, coming up here soon. We have another webinar on June 3rd and uh, the one the following week on June 10th. Uh, so uh, be on the lookout. I sent out uh, register, uh, the pre-registration stuff already today as well on those ones. Um, so we'll see you guys uh, next week and gals next week if, if you're able to, to attend. Cool. Hold on, uh, Jeremy, there's a question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, Frank. Go ahead. No, I was going to say Nick had one more. I, I just saw I just saw another question pop up in the chat. That's probably for Frank or Jeremy. Uh, what do you look for in a crew to get to the state final game? So, what are you guys looking for? <laughs> we want the best. <laughs> yeah. There's question. so many great crews, and it's so hard to answer that question. There's so many great crews throughout the state of Florida, and every association has. Um, obviously evaluates a little bit different um 
we started about four years ago evaluating, trying to evaluate the best we could throughout the playoffs, the first two or three rounds to get to the semifinals and finals. Um, and quite honestly, I use outside people to evaluate. I don't use associations. Uh, we use, um, I send people to games uh, by themselves. Uh, I use National Federation, the TV cut of the game is much better for to view officials than the huddle cut. Uh, when I can't get a National Federation game, we'll use the huddle film to evaluate. Um, really the overall, the biggest piece is making sure the overall crew is equipped to work a championship game. And from top to bottom, you know, one through eight's gotta be strong from the clock operator to the referee. And if you're not, and there's a weak link, and uh, oftentimes I'll communicate that with the association, hey, this person's not very good, or they need to get a little better, and they don't get better, then we don't move on. Quite honestly, every year there's probably 10 to 12 crews that could work. We have eight state championship games. It's a very difficult process for us to cheer for me to choose the eight and who's going to go and why. And um, it's very, very difficult. And a lot of the, the other piece of that is where do you fit um, as far as can you work that game? Uh, I had a great meeting the other night with Broward, uh, the Broward uh, County Offic Football Officials Board of Directors. And one of the question was, uh, Frank, how difficult is it when we have a lot of Dade and Broward teams that play for state championships? Is that, you know, is that, is it difficult to assign us a state championship game for that reason? Well, absolutely. Uh, I send Broward down in the day to work the biggest games as a neutral clue during the playoffs. If Naples is coming over to day to play a game, I'll send Broward or Palm beach. Uh, so they've worked those game those teams obviously already early in the playoffs. Then you get to the championship game. There's a new wrinkle in there that a lot of our, you know, three of our championship games are in Tallahassee. Uh, so it, is it feasible for a crew of eight to take off three days from work? Uh, to come to Tallahassee to work, uh, you know, all those things play into it. Uh, it's very difficult. I'm going to do a better job, as I shared with them, of being very way more transparent with regards to what we're looking for. And then the feedback part is kind of a double-edged sword. A lot of the time, I use outside people, uh, and I'll a lot of the time they use they use the National Federation on TV cut. So sometimes we're Officials I've learned are used to the one, two, threes, or the, are we a five, a four? Uh, uh, oftentimes I tell my evaluators, I don't want all that because what happens is everyone ends up being a three or a four. I, I want you to tell me specifically the strengths and the weaknesses of this crew or this person. And uh, the bottom line is, do you feel like this crew is ready to work a state championship game? And they'll tell me no or yes. And if it's a yes, then I asked them, um, you know, are you sure? And would you assign this crew to your state championship game? Uh, and if they say no, then I, I need a reason why, obviously. And I need to do a better job of sharing that information. This is a long an answer. I don't want to talk around the answer because it's very difficult. And there's so many pieces. But I can tell you after five years of doing this, um, one of the things that I'm going to get better at this year is being more transparent with regards to the feedback because we're never going to get better without feedback. And um, the earlier associations form their playoff crew, their number one seven man crew, and allow those people to work together maybe one time during the regular season uh, is helpful to me. And if they would let me know, then I'll have them evaluated at that game. And then they'll get feedback even before the playoffs start. So I hope that answers your question. Frank, I had a question uh, to piggyback on what you just said about working seven person crews leading up to the playoffs. We tried doing that and we get, at least from some people uh, at the top of our association, the coaches don't want seven because they might, we might have more fouls. Well, it doesn't make sense because they need, they need to get used to it because there are seven in the playoffs. Is that something you could, uh, that, that FHSA can interject uh, if we want to put um, a seven person crew on a, on a, on a, critical game we have during the regular season. That's something you could, where you could step in. I could, I get, I can't obviously make them do that. Right. But, uh, Some kind of influence. You know, Bowles is playing Reigns. 
uh, that's what I'm talking about. Exactly. It's an absolute great opportunity for a seven man crew to work a game and get that work because both those teams are going to go in the playoffs and probably go really deep. Exactly. And they need work with that also because there's a lot more eyes on those two receivers, that receiver and that DB. Right. And the seven man crew versus a five man crew. And it's good for them also. Uh, so, yes, I can definitely help with that. Right. From the monetary standpoint, a lot of people get worried, well, I got to pay two more officials. There's some associations that'll eat it. Uh, and I tell all of our associations, don't take that option first. Uh, talk to your school. Say, hey, we want to send a seven-man crew. Quite honestly, I was a head football coach and athletic director for 10 years. Uh, actually, athletic director for six. But, um, you know, if my association said, hey, I want to send a seven-man crew, I'd say, sure, no problem. Uh, they're going to send me the bill and I'm going to pay it and we're all going to keep it moving. Uh, and uh, that's the bottom line. So, yes, I can help anytime you want to do that. Right. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and if any association puts their number one seven man crew together or their number two crew together during the regular season, please let me know and I'll have them looked at by an outside per by an outside group. Great. Thank you. There is one last question that I think really needs to be addressed here. It's from Sam Cologne. He says, any recommendations for officials that transfer from another state? Uh, you know, I can't, I, I started out in Florida. I moved to Kentucky for about four years and I came back to Florida. So I, I kind of transferred states twice. Uh, I, my best uh, advice I can give you is don't come in thinking you know it all. Uh, your state may do something better uh, than Florida. Florida may do other things better than you. But uh, I also do martial arts, and we have a saying, if you come in with a full cup, I can't teach you anything. Okay. But if you come in with an empty cup, I could fill your cup with a lot of information. And, and, and that's what we need to do coming into a new state. Uh, you know, take it, uh, you know, take it in, learn from things. And then when you start getting some relationships uh, built after some time, maybe you can make some suggestions for changing. You know, one of the things I never like in any job I've ever had, secular or officiating, uh, is, well, my last job, we did this. Just come up with the, you know, it's better to say, I have an idea, or here's a suggestion, but never bring up, in my last job, or in my last state, you know, we did this. I think it's better that way to come across as you're communicating. What about you, Scott? Yeah, I agree, Nick. I, I came from New York to Jacksonville, so Yankee coming into essentially the South, the extension of the South. Um, I kept my mouth shut. I said, hey, you know, I was a referee at the time I was in my 20s, and I was a referee in New York, and I told, I told them what I'd done. Nobody cares what you've done. They want to see what you can do. So um, just keep your mouth shut and listen. So I went from being uh, essentially, uh, I'd say it laughed at for suggesting and asking to be a referee when I came in to now um, being a, the, chief, the chairman of the recommendation committee. So, it, you know, it, you just have to um, adjust to the environment. Um, listen, make, make, make allies. Uh, and uh, don't, again, like you said, don't come in knowing it all. Just listen. You know, you have to adjust the culture. You know, a crew is a microcosm of an association. I mean, you, it's a culture. So um, you have to adjust. Um, and, you know, the good, great thing about fishing is that 99.9% .9 of us are in the, that are in this business, and I call it a business, are good people. Otherwise, we, you, know, you can't go into the trenches with people that aren't good people and they get weeded out. So um, we're all brothers and sisters. So just keep an open mind, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. That's, that's what I have to say. To piggyback on that more from an administrative side, a lot of our transfer officials don't realize that we do accept years of experience from other states as well. So if you have that, whatever state you were officiating in, if you have 10 years of experience, have that state send a letter to us and we'll add that to your account. I mean, if that's going to affect your ranking here. So if you have 10 years there, it's good for, for Florida as well. So just make sure that that gets transferred to us at the office. Absolutely. Administratively is one thing, but <laughs> culturally is something totally different. But you're right, uh, Taylor.
All right. Actually, I don't. I think that's it. The first question is Jeremy. Yeah, I think we will put it into tonight. Again, cool. thank you, Scott and Nick, for uh, being here with us tonight. Uh, awesome really appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me. And I hope thank everybody stays safe. All right. Hope to see you soon. Hey, thank you, guys. I'll be